Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Dr. Marnie Hill Farder. Help me. <laughs> Fadero. Fadero. Thank yeah. you. And uh, she had a spiritually transformative experience um, so much that it prompted her to start researching near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, welcome to the show. And I'm so well, excited to have you here. Thank you, Peggy. I'm really so excited myself to be here with you. I've been following you for years and I just love that you have this platform for people to share their experiences. Thank you. That's yeah. nice to know when you know someone's I've been watching your show because you know I don't have faces mm -hmm. to go with the audience usually. Yeah, sure. No. Um, so your spiritually transformative experience, you want to start there? Yeah, I'd be very happy to. Um, you know, I I was um going along living the American dream, kind of a fairy tale life and um, at one point, I, I knew that I needed to leave a, a toxic relationship, uh, a marriage after 27 years. And so I was um, definitely in kind of a survival mode, um, but hitting some very low points as anyone would that, you know, had to make a choice to to make a huge change in their life. And um I ended up having to have a garage sale. Um, I lost everything, uh, my home, my money, even adult children to parental alienation, which was one of the, the lowest points. But I, I had a garage sale. But you know, I like to say, I don't think we talk about that enough. Yeah. Oh, about about traumatic experiences. Alienation and adult children because it continues. Oh, definitely. I, I've, I've actually been alienated from an adult daughter for over eight years now. And, and um, you know, these were adults. They were not young children at the time. But, you know, divorce is hard on anyone. Separation is hard on anyone. Um, but when you're dealing with kind of a malignant, covert, narcissistic type individual who's out to destroy you at all costs, they ramp up their abuse even after you leave. And when they realize they can't break you because you've, you know, you've lost everything um, that you've worked towards, um, then they go for what really, really hurts. And that is the children. And so it, it is, um, you know, a, a very common, unfortunately, it's a very common experience that happens to both men and women. It's not a gender yes. or, or role specific situation, but where they they get the adult children to align with them. So the, the children, even the adults are aligning with the abuser. Um, and it's almost like a cult with the brainwashing. You know, these people can rewrite memories. It doesn't matter if you have years and years of scrapbooks showing physical, tangible proof of, of wonderful childhood experiences. They can throw those things away. They can, you know, implant very subtly, um, you know, uh, false experiences so that these adult children then kind of look at their life and they cut off one parent and oftentimes, well, the majority of the time, the entire side of that family. Um, and then they go around there. Yeah, it is heartbreaking. And so, you know, it's good that we're even mentioning this in a near-death experience platform because people that have had spiritually transformative experiences or near-death experiences often experience some sort of trauma. So in NDEs, of course, the people flatline and they experience all sorts of things um, where they go to heaven or they can see their body on an operating table or, or they experience, you know, otherworldly events when they have died. Um, but I also believe that trauma, like my trauma in, and it was my choice to leave the marriage. I, I knew that that was the healthiest thing for myself and for my children, you know, to continue to be a mom who role models 
you know, what is good to do, but losing those adult children was, I, it was just so unnatural. I think and we need to form the, the term trauma induced near death experience. Right. And actually that is what's happened to me. It's trauma induced STEs, which is yeah, there you go. virtually tr transformative encounters or experiences. Okay. See, I didn't know there was a word for it, but yeah, I've talked about it, but I, oh, there we go. Okay. So yeah. it's uh, um, trauma induced spiritually transformative experience. Interesting. Right. And and it's wonderful to have a platform like this to just have these conversations because, you know, it, even though you have talked to hundreds of people um, and then you even have had your own experiences, we all can learn something new from someone else and what they have gone through. So, so definitely, you know, I had trauma and, and it put me into a place just of disbelief um but also survival mode but instead of being angry and negative and revengeful and vindictive things that are just not part of who i am as a person i had feelings of gratitude and love and being thankful that i had 20 plus years with my adult children or that i i got to experience marriage even though it was under a lot of false pretenses. And there were so many red flags that I was dealing with someone whose ethics and integrity and morals and belief and honesty, all that was completely different than my own core values and beliefs. I still, even in my fantasy land, you know, got to experience um, what I thought was, you know, um, a happy marriage and a beautiful family life. Now, now were you all, atheist before your experience? I, I was, yeah, yeah. So I actually grew up atheist. Um, I did not have exposure to organized religion or any kind of spirituality. So really, I was someone who required a lot more proof that another realm in our world existed, a spiritual realm. I needed more proof than most people because I didn't have that kind of blind faith foundation that a lot of people have um, that would, you know, let them transition to really accepting that there is a God or that there is a, a, a spiritual world. Um, so I really needed to do a lot of research. And, and so when I had this garage sale, um, like I said, I was just, I was just in a state of gratitude and love and thankfulness that I got to experience a lot of things that many people only dream of, you know, and, uh, but little did I know it was kind of a dream in itself. Um, but I actually had some spiritual encounters that caught my attention, you know, uh, that really made me think and reflect. Some of it was at the garage sale. Some of it was after the garage sale, when I would go back and think about the different people or situations that really made me think there was something more going on here that, you know, God, if there was a God, and I didn't know at the time, I, I sort of knew I was leaning towards that, but it was totally confirmed by my experiences that were just life-changing. And, and I'll get into some of those experiences. Um, and a lot of them I, I put into my spiritual fiction called God Came to My Garage Sale. Um, and even though it is a spiritual fiction, fiction meaning fake, it was really inspired by true events that I either experienced or in my years of research of other NDEers or attending IONS conferences, 
um, and hearing hundreds and hundreds of accounts of people that have experienced things, I incorporated some of those experiences into my spiritual fiction. And I, I chose to write a fiction because I wanted to reach an audience that might not tune into your near-death experience TV or might not pay attention to someone's real account of what happened. I wanted to have a novel that would be an easy read and with a catchy title that someone might pick up. And then through reading my words, it might prompt them to really look into this more. Okay. Good idea. So that, yeah. So that they could was leave their beliefs on the table, you know, alone and, you know, just experience these events and then make up their own mind so right yeah. right and we all need to make up our own mind about these things but i'll tell you my life was forever changed by experiencing these things um it's almost like i didn't have a choice i i had to accept that that there was something otherworldly going on here. And, and just like so many people, like yourself included, where you wrote your wonderful book and, and a lot of people that, that are, are uh, prompted to write books or speak um, on their experiences, I too, it was just an overwhelming need to put down my experiences on paper somehow and get the message out there that we life is not just what happens on our earthly plane that there is more to this this earth and and if we can suffer we meaning humans if we can suffer such tremendous losses and in my case you know, it was the loss of a dream of a, a happy marriage and family. But then eventually it was, you know, when I found out my domestic violence situation included parental alienation, that was just so unnatural and devastating for me. And it's something I'm still coping with. And anybody um, that doesn't know what we're talking about, watch Stepmom. Yeah, yeah. And I think the most um, important part in that was when the little boy tells his mom, mom, I'll hate her if you want me to, meaning I would hate the stepmom. Right. And right. she looks at him and you can see, you know, you're thinking that she's thinking, what am I doing here? I'm teaching my child to hate. Right. And I mean, they what... want them to hate. But then when you, when the child actually says, I will hate them if you want me to, it's like, I would think they'd be like staring you in the face. Look what you're doing. But, you know, unfortunately, not everyone has a kind, loving heart and an empathetic soul. That's true. And so yeah. that is a very tough reality that someone you loved, whether it was a spouse, um, a best friend, a family member, um, someone you looked up to, maybe a church leader, you know, it is just um, very, very hard to accept that not everyone has the same good values that you possess. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough reality, a tough pill to swallow, you know, because we can go along life and we get ourselves very busy with our jobs and our lives that we let a lot of red flags, you know, go by unattended. And, and so years can actually go by before we are prompted by some traumatic event usually you know, or some kind of revelation, a light bulb moment to stop and say, Hey, what this is, this is not, this is not uh, aligning with who I am as a person. And, and then you're prompted to make a change. And, you know, ideally if someone finds them in that situation with a spouse or a family member, it would be good to just take some time and reflect and do some research on what are some different ways to handle it? I didn't do that. I followed my gut feeling and just, I knew something, something was wrong. And for someone who usually has no problem speaking, I found myself going silent. And within a day I was physically assaulted where my, my ex-husband threw me up against the wall, shoved me up against the wall and said, don't you dare divorce me. And if you divorce me, I'll take your house, your money, and your children. And 
I was so shocked by that thinking, well, who says something like that? I mean, don't you dare divorce me. You would think that if, if your spouse, if, you know, and in my case, you know, he, the night before he had confessed to a number of wrongdoings that just were shocking to me and, and prompted me, prompted my silence almost just to kind of take it all in. Um, so obviously in his mind, he, he knew that, you know, he knows the values that I have as an empathetic, loving, caring, accepting person. I'm sure the wheels were spinning. And for whatever reason, he knew I might be thinking of leaving this 27 year marriage um, because I never said a word about it, but for him to say, don't you dare divorce me. It just seems so strange to me. Like who says something like that? Like, wouldn't a person want to play nice and try to smooth over the situation so that it can go along, you know, especially if they don't want you to divorce them, wouldn't they um, turn on the charm or, you know, somehow even have a heart to heart with you to help you change your th thoughts or mind. Um, or a person in that situation might accept that, okay, I've, I've used this person as long as I possibly can. I've gotten as much narcissistic supply from them as, as possible that, that I will go along and let them go. But no, to say something like that was just mind blowing. And actually, you know, I know we're, we need to get back to it's talking okay. about the, the spiritual transformative experiences, but, you know, the abuse of a, a, a domestic violence perpetrator oftentimes really ramps up after the separation, right? Because they are, they are generally people that have a false persona of a fake mask that they wear for the public that let, you know, where other people think that they are, you know, people of integrity and honesty and goodness. And lots of times these people hold high positions in the community. So they are very well respected and they love that. They love that kind of role that they play, that they are above other people. Um, and, and I didn't know it, but for many, many years, I was gaslit to believe that I was not thinking straight. I was not worthy or capable. Luckily, I kept my wonderful full-time teaching position. I was a high school special ed teacher for 35 years. 12 of those years, I was an adjunct graduate school professor. So I had already been fairly accomplished, you know, academically with degrees and that type of thing. Um, very, very thankful that I I had that in, in some way, I, I think that provided narcissistic supply because, you know, he could say, well, my wife has a doctorate degree or my wife teaches at the university or something like that. You know, it's not so much that they are, you know, um, happy for you that you've achieved some things or that you're making a difference in the world of education. It's almost like, what can your role do for them to make them look better? Um, so, but luckily and, and I, as an educated woman is so shocking when you, that moment, when you find yourself in a domestic violence situation, it's like that happened to other women. That doesn't happen to women like me. I know right. that's how I felt. I was working with helping domestic violence women all the time. And all of a sudden I'm thrown against the wall by my husband. I'm like, yeah. I'm going to die here. I'm one of those women. Right. And that's, that's the thing. It doesn't matter you know, what your um, accomplishments are, or how intelligent or common sense, you know, the, the common sense that you have, you still can find yourself in a position where you have been gaslit slowly to believe that you are not, you know, worthy or capable. And in the meantime, they are smearing your name since day one, probably even before the right. marriage. And like they you said, are, their voice. Right. They're planting seeds of doubt in other people. Yeah. In addition to yourself, you know, you start questioning your own interests in your own friendships because they slowly 
um, they just have a very covert way of belittling you. It's a it's psychological manipulation. And so, you know, if that can happen to reasonable and intelligent adults, it sure can happen to young children and definitely even to adult children. And so that's why it's, it's extremely shocking and awareness needs to be brought about this um, because, you know, it is rampant. It is, is all over. And, you know, even when we, we think about the global situation that all of us have had to face in many different ways the last few years, it's like corruption and fraud and deceit is really coming out into the forefront. And it's shocking to so many of us, like, how can this happen? You know, can't they see the truth? And so if it's happening on a global scale, realize that it's it, very easy to have it happen on, on a local personal level. Having worked in the government, I'm so happy now that it's finally coming to light. And I'm wondering if they're gonna do anything about it because- right. It, it starts, I mean, I started noticing on a local level, the payoffs, the yeah. favors, and then start realizing it's, it's, it's huge. It's even in the highest of levels of government. It's huge. And, you know, it's, it's kind of prompted me that experience along with just my own personal trauma experience and then wonderful spiritual encounters that happened as a result, it kind of has given me the impression that we're really dealing with dark versus light. And, we're and, and it's more, even though there's financial and medical and legal corruption, there's also just evil versus good. And, and I think the quiet is gonna to have to get their voice. Yeah. And those are trying to get control. We need to realize when something's trying to get control of us and not go silent, but to like equal that control. Don't let that playing field get, you know, where one is over, you know, just like a husband and wife. We can allow them and not realize that how they're over controlling us and we seek them down and they come up higher. And I, and I've just learned that when you start to see that imbalance, even if I'm the one causing it, if I'm being controlling, I need to lower myself and let that, you know, teeter totter go straight and not keep that, you know, because nobody wants to bombard. I mean, seriously, down deep, overpower somebody else like that. That's well, not good for anybody. Up, you bring up a really good point, and I, I don't think I've ever even heard it explained that way, which is, which is a really great way to explain it because it's very easy to diminish yourself when you're dealing with someone who is not only overpowering you, but doing it in a calculated manner where there is deceitful manipulation that is driving their need to do that. So the, the bottom line is, you know, with all of this is just, research and understanding and having these conversations to help people find their voice uh, because the fear is real you know um, especially when you're dealing with a perpetrator the fear of being brought back to court you know I filed for divorce 10 years ago and my abuser is still bringing me to court and when i chose to divorce him there were no minor children involved yet it was considered a, an extremely high conflict divorce with numerous numerous lawyers and 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 so much just uh, you know they, they almost leave things open-ended so that they keep the the abuse going within the court system you know when they can't control you they control how others see you and then they just try to keep connected to you by legal threats or stalking and harassment and that type of thing i even moved from the chicago suburbs a lifetime in the chicago suburbs and i've lived the last three years in the caribbean I moved thousands and thousands of miles away to start a wonderful new life here, which, which I have to say is coming to fruition. It is just a wonderful existence that I have here. But the abusers don't want to let you go easily, you know, and they will keep up their false narrative 
till the day they die. Um, they will, you know, you, you, you don't really hear of people that do bad things and are, are illegal or immoral activities confessing to what they're doing and saying, oh yeah, they were right. You know, I really did some bad things. Um, and the damage is done, unfortunately. So many people with parental alienation, there are not a lot of success stories of reunification. There, there might be a little bit more when you're dealing with very young children and, you know, and if the courts can, can, uh, you know, look objectively to the situation, but lots of times um, it's the abusers that are the ones that are calm, cool, and collected in court and oftentimes are right. rewarded, rewarded with custody or whatever. Um, and it's the dad or mom that has, they've lost their kids. They're frazzled. They're like, how can this happen? You know, and, and they are the ones that are wanting equal um, care of the children. Like I, as, as abusive as my ex-husband was to me, I would not interfere with my children having a relationship with, with him. And, and that is the sign of a, a, a normal range, good parent. They know that children need both a dad and mom in their life. They're not trying to sever the bonds that, that, you know, they have right. as a mother, I thought it was my job to shelter my children from any of that. I didn't talk right. to them about what your dad just did yeah. and all the, no, I want them to have a happy, normal life. Right. Right. But unfortunately, you know, in these domestic violence situations, not everyone has that kind of ethical, moral, neutral right. uh, position. So, so some ways I think my spiritual experiences at this garage sale, which prompted me to really look into um, near death experiences and, and STEs, you know, and, and really prompted me to write this book, sort of opened the door for more writing for me. In fact, I have a five book series that um, is called True Deceit, False Love. And it's um, terms and phrases, acrostic poetry, a workbook, even a word search puzzle book on domestic violence, narcissistic abuse, parental alienation, and intergenerational family trauma. Because when we have gone through these things, at some point, it is very, very healthy and necessary for you to do some inner work on yourself, to and look into why was I a target for an abuser? What is it about me and my behavior or my thinking that allowed someone to treat me so poorly? Or how did I find myself in this situation? And it's important that we take some ownership, not in that it takes two to tango, because with an abuser, that's not necessarily the Yeah, case. and don't tell your friends that are going through domestic violence, what did you do to make him do it? <laughs> Right, <laughs> that's right. not what she's saying. <laughs> right, and and to, and to say what is your what was your role in this? Because really, when you're dealing with a domestic abuser, it is that one person, whether it is you know a, a wife against a husband, a husband against a wife, even w whether it's a grandparent that is getting involved in a very unhealthy way with your children. Um, or it could even be, you know, neighbors or friends, you know, it's not always, you know, just a, a marital situation, but the reality is, is that it's not a, it takes two to tango situation. It really is one abusive person taking advantage of a more empathetic, loving person. But I think that my spiritual transformative experiences actually led, led me to writing about what I experienced helped me get a framework of just love and peace and goodness, keeping true to my values that enabled me actually to write my five book series um, that does address some of these other topics. So what um, happened and at I, the garage and I sale? write in a way. <laughs> well, let me tell you, there were some things. <laughs> Well, there were many, there were many, many different events. One pretty significant event was when I was at the cul-de-sac looking back at my home 
And like I said before, instead of having negative feelings, I just had a deep feeling of gratitude and, and love and peace. And all of a sudden, a dragonfly circled me. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool, you know, but I didn't think too much of it. And, and even when five dragonflies circled me, I didn't think too much of it. But within a five to 10 minute period, I had 50 to 100 dragonflies circling me. And I could see them go down the road and I could see them come back to the cul-de-sac and circle me. And this experience, like every other single spiritual experience that I have had, and I've had many, um, it was all done in slow motion where there was like no time. It was like the air was clear jello. I had it just written down as you was talking about time going still, because yes. that's when those, when you get in that state of that gratitude, that deep feeling of gratitude, it seems like time stops and stands yes. still and experiences can happen. And that's what's happened to me. In fact, I'm, I'm mentoring this a lovely 27 year old poet on this island here. We just seem to meet up at synchronistic times or whatever. And she was explaining to me that she would get into a dream state because she's extremely spiritual herself and she's a master of words. Um, her name is Maya and I'm going to be following her career because uh, her poetry is beautiful. Um, and, but she looks at me like I'm a mentor because I've just encouraged her to write. And we've just had so many kind of synchronistic meetings on the island here. But she also says the same thing, that she's in a dreamlike state or that it's, it's like, you know, time just stands still. And if I didn't experience this myself, and if I didn't experience it you know, 15 to 20 times where time stood still, I wouldn't have believed it. So, and I was something about that. That time standing still after I lost my twins from ectopic pregnancy in the E, I was in his depression. And then, then I walked down the steps one day into the living room and there was my ex-husband and our three little boys that were little Falls, they fell asleep on the carpet in front of the TV. And I just had this moment from the first time since I lost the twins, which is probably a month or so, of gratitude. Oh, look at them. Oh, you know, I felt the love for them and appreciated and gratitude because I couldn't because I was mourning the twins. You know, how do, you, how do I connect now to my three little boys and I'm mourning these twins and I was just so co conflicted. So I had this moment and at time stood still as I feel this gratitude. Then suddenly I'm back in 1966. I'm a five-year-old kid knocking on the bathroom door and this ex thing happened. I we got lost in this time. And I don't think that time standing still is just a, let me say a metaphor or a, it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. It is. It's, it's, it's unbelievable when you experience it. In fact, you know, one interview that I did with, with someone, um, he believes that I'm a time bender. That's a term that he uses because all of my experiences are when time stood still. So with the dragonfly experience at the garage sale, I could actually see the veins and the wings of every dragonfly, the 50 to a hundred dragonflies that are circling me. It was so slow that I could see their veins. I could see the iridescent colors. And then I made note that there were many different sizes and I equated them to people, like as if they were babies and toddlers and teenagers and young adults and grandparents. And, you know, I just felt surrounded. The feeling that I had while I was just in this daze, um, where I, I blocked out everything else. You were on the other side. I was on the other side, definitely. The feeling I had was that I was loved and I was supported. And I actually heard a message that, Marnie, you're going to make it. You're going to make it, you know, through this experience. And luckily, Peggy, during this experience, I actually thought about three quarters of the way to pull out my cell phone and videotape what I experienced. Because... 
I was slowly coming back into like earth reality. And that is when I'm like, I'm pulling out my phone so that I can show Rick, my life partner. Now I could show him what I was experiencing. Um, so that is just one of many experiences. Another experience that I had um, actually came through a television set. And I've heard of experiencing experiences happening through electronics. I mean, there's huge volumes of research documentation that electronics, you can hear people from the other side or you can you know, get messages through electronics. And I happened to be sitting at a nail salon and I write about this in, in a version, you know, I was definitely inspired to write about this in one of the chapters in my book. Um, but I was, I was getting a pedicure and I was looking at the TV, just mindless. And all of a sudden a, an infomercial kind of came on for a certain type of product. I think it was Dr. Paracone's, you know, some real expensive beauty product that I never had the money to buy or felt I had the money to buy. Um, but a friend of mine that had just recently passed away she had purchased this and I was helping um, her family kind of go through her belongings uh, because it was very painful for them. And I came across these products and I actually just opened a jar and put some cream on my face and but felt very guilty for doing that, <laughs> even though she was not here and she had want. I'm sure she would have wanted like you were me. stealing. I, I know it was just an like I felt felt uncomfortable, like I shouldn't have done that, but I did do it. And it felt so good. It was almost like I was connecting with her in a way. So I was just mesmerized when I was at this nail salon, looking at this um, TV infomercial on this particular product. And I was just paying attention to it. And to me, the commercial seemed to go on for hours and hours and hours. Yet there's no way I would have been sitting there at a nail salon for hours like that. And then, Peggy, one of the neatest things happened. All of a sudden on the screen came a different type of infomercial about her hometown, which I write about a different hometown, but her real hometown was Petersburg, Illinois, from Southern Illinois. And she had always wanted me to come visit her town and I'd never seen it. And I've been to Southern Illinois, but I didn't know about this town. And I actually got an aerial view of their main street of this town. And so I'm just focused and paying attention. And, and somehow even on the bottom, it said Petersburg, Illinois. And, and I thought, well, that's weird. What, I wonder what this commercial is about. And, you know, are they selling something from this town? And I, I just was trying to make sense of it, but paying attention to this infomercial. And at one point, um, there was an ambulance, like a picture of an ambulance with this old woman in the back of the ambulance. And I had never seen this old woman before. And um, she was just talking about what a wonderful town this was. And I was experiencing this, but I was just also trying to make sense of it. And it didn't make sense to me. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what are they selling? Are they, are they highlighting the EMT services of this town? I couldn't figure it out. So anyway, this went on. I felt I was sitting at this nail salon, looking at this second infomercial, I felt I was there for days. When, when, and I didn't even think to, to ask the person next to me, are, are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing? Like, you know, on, on the TV here? I mean, looking back, I kind of believe that I'm the only one who could see this, that maybe the other people didn't see it. And I remember kind of coming to at some point where the nail salon tech said, and, and what color would you like for your nail polish? And I'm thinking, that had to have only been like five minutes, 10 minutes at the most. Have you but wondered if these hours. are, out, I'm sorry, have you wondered if these are out of body experiences? Not that you're going other places, but you're just slightly out of your body experiencing the other side. I believe that I was. I believe that I was. And, and a, 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 just a side note to this 
was later on when I was continuing to help the family go through, you know, my friend's belongings and stuff, I came across a photograph of that lady, of that lady that I saw sitting at the back of an ambulance. And I was like, who is this old lady? And they said, well, her name is Maida and she's, you know, was a good friend of, you know, this friend Elizabeth. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, this is the lady I saw. I saw this lady in, in this experience that I had. And, and so that was this particular experience with coming through electronics, with time standing still, and then realizing, actually at a later time too, I forgot to mention, I looked up her town, Petersburg, Illinois, and the first photograph was the aerial vision that I saw. So that, and I had never seen that before, but it was down to every single little store was the same and the cars and everything. That was just, just, it confirmed for me that I had some sort of out of body experience. So I didn't have to physically die to go right. to this realm. And, and actually there's a lot more evidence now that there are a number of people that are having what's called STEs spiritually transformative encounters or experiences. So much so that Dr. Yvonne Kaysen, who many of your listeners have heard of, um, she has started an organization called SAI, Spiritual Awakenings International. And she found, she and the board members found value in my telling my stories that I am now going to be speaking in June, this June at the international conference on this, along with numerous other, um, I believe very famous people that have talked about their, their spiritual transformative experiences. But and just I'd like to say, so people don't misunderstand, this isn't, because I know some people will think, oh, this is somebody's imagination running away with them that's not what we're talking about if your imagination is running away you are actively moving that along this is an experience that happens out of the ordinary you didn't do anything to provoke it it's like it chooses you and Definitely. you are now in that realm that we talk about do we have that we are in during your death experiences i call it the heavenly realm land of all knowing and it's also timeless you're you're experiencing those timeless shifts because that's that realm. And so even though you're not near death, you're not under trauma at the nail salon, but it seems like once you might have had a, a trauma spiritually induced experience, whatever you want to call, that it opens you up. And sometimes it just seems like that realm chooses you. Right. And I, you know, even though I wasn't experiencing, you know, acute trauma at the nail salon, I certainly was experiencing the loss of a friend um, and, and trying to come to terms with that. I also was in the phase of my life knowing that I, by choice, was going to change my life and I knew it would never be the same. Um, and I was sad, but also very hopeful. You know, I had a, a like bitter sweet, sweet feelings. I had no idea that that you know I would lose adult children to parental alienation and feel that that deep pain and, and grief, which is very much um, can be compared to losing a child in the physical. You go through all the same stages of grief. And um, there's just an added layer that they are out there in the world and and you know, they, they are believing a false narrative and want nothing to do with you. And, you know, th they will um, fight your, your attempts to reach out. And then of course, abusers will throw legal constraints in there too, to make it so that legally, you know, if you choose to reach out and say, I love you to your child, that you will be put in jail or something like that. They, they, they want to control that so bad. And, and actually, in, in my particular case, you know, the siblings, so I have two children, haven't even talked with each other for many, many years. And the abusers will do that. They'll isolate um, siblings from each other so that they can't really compare notes and say, Hey, do you remember this? Or, you know, this, they, they won't, you know, they, they want this narrative 
Yeah. So, and if, and if people so, listening are in those situations and thinking, well, what do I do? I don't know. But for me, uh, a few months ago, I was ex- noticing that one of our adult children was being pulled in a direction and I called him and I just cried and I told him how I felt because I was always voiceless. You know, I didn't bring my kids into trauma and drama, you know, and so they won that other side always won because I thought, well, that's on them. I'm not putting my kids through it, but I thought, okay, he's at the age now. I think I can talk to him. And I caught, I intend on crying when I called, but my voice was cracking where it was breaking through that my tears was breaking through because I don't like my kids didn't know that I'm crying. And I just told him, you know, some things that he had been sheltered from. And I said, I am not trying to turn you away from your father. I want, I didn't have a father. So I went through a lot to make sure you boys still had a father. Yeah. And, but I'm telling you, this and that and the other. And his thing is, well, that was in the past. There's nothing can do with me. I said, but I see it affecting you now in the way you're relating with this other person. And so that I believe your father's, I didn't tell him, but I believe his father's turning him against this person. And so, you know, and the next time we were together, things were calmer, you right. know, because I know so friction building. And so, you know, I just talk to your kids and you don't have to put the other parent down, let them know that you're saying these things out of love and concern for them. As I don't right, know. But I'm, I'm, and I think it's great that you shared your personal experiences to actually show that even with adult children, you're still trying to navigate, you know, th- that situation. And as a parent, you want to be honest and show love and help them in their awareness. But unfortunately, a lot of times that can be misconstrued and and the abuser has much more control and power over over people because they are they're master manipulators. That's kind of that's part of who they are. They lie, cheat and steal. You know, that's not who who the empathetic people are. Yeah, There are there are adult children that will not speak to that parent. Because right. they've been so brainwashed, their mind is up and they don't hear anything else. And it's at right. all cost. You're not going to get anywhere. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes it takes those children getting much older and experiencing alienation with their own children that the light bulb goes on and, and that really... Um, then they are putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Like even in my case, when I had to do my intergenerational work, I knew I came from a divorced family. I knew that my mom had challenges, but I really didn't realize that my dad was kind of setting up a narrative that we all believed for most of our lives. So, you know, and, and, even at the age of 90, they're going to keep with their narrative. They yeah. might even, you know, believe their own lies. And you see that happening even on the TV now that people are lying and dishonest and they are belie- they really believe they their do. own lies, <laughs> you know? And, and so it gets to that point. But, you know, so here in my 60s, I'm finally connecting the dots to my own family situation and, you know, um, That's a long time, you know, unfortunately, our children um, might not ever come back because they're believing such a false narrative. But, you know, what I have chosen to do, not only write about my spiritual experiences that were life changing and have brought me so much inner peace and knowing, I have also, through my five book series, True Deceit, False Love, bringing awareness to these things. Without telling my own personal story, I'm really telling the story of anyone that has been in a challenging domestic abusive situation. And so hopefully they'll at some point, if they're interested, might say, hey, you know, I, I'll, I'll uh, put in a search engine my mom's name and see what comes up. And they might see, wow, she, you know, who, who spends 
so much time and energy writing a series of books if they didn't really experience something, you know, I mean, that takes a lot of energy and effort. And so maybe they, they will little by little come to see that there are different sides to their own, you know, childhood journey or adult journey. And that, you know, maybe things aren't exactly what they were made to believe. And somewhere we got the message in our society to cut out all negativity from your life. Like, so if somebody's depressed, just cut them out. You can't deal with that. Or somebody's going through some anger or something. You just cut them out. And I was like, come on, you're stronger than that. Be a right. shoulder for somebody. Don't run from everything. And I think um, kids, adults now, because I'm the same age group as you, I'm 61. And that they just see, um, they just avoid anything that isn't for them. You know, even if their Happy Meal isn't right, you know, their McDonald's meal, they're throwing a fit. We have to have everything so perfect. And like on these channels, people say, well, this was this and this was that. And it's like the whole world doesn't have to be perfect, suited just to fit you or you're going to throw it out. And they throw people out all the time. Well, this right. person, actually, I can't deal with it. Right. And actually the challenges, you know, that we go through sometimes make us who we are. So even though... I experienced things that no good person should ever experience. Um, but I did. But I, I believe how I'm choosing to handle it makes makes a big difference um, in, in the outcome of things. Because so these instead young of just, wives, these young women going through these things, they don't know what to do. Right. Well, well turn the kids again. They, and I see them on Facebook every now and then I always stop and take the time. And, you know, they're a young mother, they're having this issue and their ex is, you know, fighting with them and keeping the kids from or whatever. And I stop or they're wanting to keep the kids away from their dad because they're mad. And I always take stop and take the time and say what you do now will affect your child's wedding, your grandchildren's births, their birthdays, everything for your child the rest of their life, the way you interact with your X right now is so important because you are setting up a whole lifetime of the mood for, for all of these events. But then there's sometimes people that can't, um, that have those good intentions to, to, um, try to handle things amicably, but, but because they're dealing with such a toxic individual and an abuser who set out to destroy that they don't stand a chance. Right. So unfortunately, you know, I, I just think it's important. I, I don't always like the term taking the high road, but I believe that I have, that I'm living in honesty and goodness and love. And with with no malicious intent i don't have any desire to cause harm to anyone and, else. and you were given these experiences for a reason i mean you were yes. atheist but god yeah. chose i believe i don't know what your belief is but yeah. i believe god chose like we're going to help her anyway this girl needs help yeah you know she don't have to believe in me we're going to give her some experiences to help give her a soothing i don't know what Right. And it did change. It changed my belief. In fact, at the end of the book, God came to my garage sale. Um, the character questions, did God really come? And I believe that God did. And so I believe I'm one of the fortunate ones that, you know, am able to have the voice, to have the ability to write, to, to have the support of some very, very kind and loving, honest people in, in my world to, to help me get the message out there that no matter what challenges we all face, and all of us have our own unique challenges, how we handle them, um, you know, is, is very important. And if we choose to handle life's challenges with love and goodness and honesty, then we are following in a very, very positive light and that's like you were an atheist living a christian values life <laughs> yeah Be definitely Some, somehow i always believed in my heart and soul that there had to be something more that that because i i did have to face even as a kid some challenging situations but i i believe i handled them 
with love and honesty and goodness. So I, I feel- we all want justice. We want yeah. fairness. We expect, yeah. we innately expect fairness. Even though you as an atheist, you expect to be treated fairly by your husband and by right. your children. You, ex you know, ingrained in us, it shouldn't be like this. Life is, should be fair. And then we get older and we realize justice is uh, a lie, you know? Yeah, justice does not always <laughs> prevail. But I believe though, Peggy, goodness and love does prevail yes. in the big scheme of things. And I've been shown through my STEs and through researching numerous, um, you know, other people's NDEs that there is a bigger reason why we are here on earth. And, and we probably even signed up for these lessons, these challenges that we were faced you know, um, and, and you've heard the saying that, you know, God only gives us as much as we can handle, you know, or um, we are here to learn life lessons. I, I'm a, I'm a believer. Yeah. In that. And I pointed that out to God a few times in my life. Hey, yeah. you don't give us more than we can handle and I can't handle this. So you're going to have to get rid of it. <laughs> right, right. Please, please help us out here. But you know, so I encourage anyone who's, who's, you know, and I know our conversation kind of took a turn. It's okay. And went where it was meant to go, right? Yeah, I think, I think it was because really, to me, it's all interrelated. The domestic challenges that I endured and continue to have to endure, along with the spiritual experiences that not only I experienced at the garage sale, but that I looked back in my life and saw you know, hey, there were some things prior to this garage sale that were were miracles that I didn't really give attention to. And there's certainly been numerous things, um, even since I have moved to the Caribbean, that have been spiritual miracles where I have gotten into that, that zone of no time. And, and amazing things have come my way. I think all of it is very interrelated. And it's good to have these just honest conversations about it. Yeah, because asked me one time, why do we have these experiences? And I said, I think so God knows where he's here. <laughs> and also to provide hope and inspiration to people that might be questioning, did I really experience that? Or, or they might look at like, hey, I've always tried to be a good person. Why are all these bad things right. happening? There could be a higher purpose yeah. to all of it. And I just hope and pray, you know, even for my own children and for alienated children and targeted parents, moms and dads out there, you know, um, April 25th is Parental Alienation Awareness Day. So they, that that is actually, you know, coming to our world's conscious collective that, you know, we need to realize that some of these things are happening and bring is there a website. We could put this on for that. You know, there are many websites and there are many different people that speak on parental alienation. So I think just okay. understanding there are probably many viewers that have never even heard the term parental alienation. Just plugging that in, you will see that there are many people talking about it. There are many books on it. There are many researchers. Like I've been very honored in my True to See False Love series that I have the endorsement support of some amazing people. Um, one of them is Dr. Jennifer Harmon, who is a researcher out of Colorado, and she deals exclusively with family violence. And, but she also does research on it to show um, the dynamics of, of how this can happen. Another person who is very, in, you know, who found value in what I was doing um, is Sherry McGregor. She has written some beautiful books on Done With the Crying about adult children who estrange. And even though estrangement is different than alienation, there are some overlaps with that. And she is a beautiful light filled source out there to bring awareness to this. And, and Dr. Sam Vaknin, who is, uh, has wrote the book, Malignant Self-Love, 
Um, he is bringing awareness, actually coined a lot of terms on narcissism, which goes along with a lot of these abusers. You know, they are not diagnosed. They don't think anything's wrong with them. They have no problem, you know, hurting other people for their own, you know, to try to build themselves up. Um, but he brings awareness. So I would say, you know, one place to, ch to check, you know, to start is to actually go to my website, which is, which is the title of my spiritual fiction, God Came to My Garage Sale. And on that website, you can see the various books that I have written. And I also highlight other people that, you know, bring awareness to, to this. There are other professionals that I kind of incorporate into my own listing of events and, and conversations that I've had to help get some other names out there for people to just look into other people that are finding their voice on this and trying to make a difference out there for people. When I worked at Children's Services, we saw it all the time. Parents using sexual abuse, Oh, yeah. to get back at the other parent. I mean, of course, it was usually the women that were trying to get their spouse, ex-spouse, boyfriend, whatever, in trouble mm -hmm. um, by saying sexual abuse. And I remember one day I said, if I hear he stuck <laughs> the finger in my butt one more time, I'm going to scream because that was mm -hmm. a red flag. Every time we heard that phrase, it right. was a mom trying to get back at a boyfriend. But then at the same time, all those false claims take away from people that are real sexual predators that are doing things. Um, I know. actually had the first case for first and only case of Munchausen by proxy that had right. to do with sexual abuse. Yeah, yeah. And but you know, people will use that like she, for she example, was literally sexually abusing the children to frame the death. Right, to frame and it, and that happens. but it also works the other way around. You know, Peggy, I haven't shared this on any platform before, but I was not officially, but I was um, unofficially accused of Munchausen by proxy against my alienated child. And first of all, I didn't even know what that was. I had to go look that up. But then the family therapist you know, who knew the children, knew the dynamics of the, you know, toxic marriage said, absolutely not. In no way does this mother, is she trying to cause harm to a child so that they are getting attention or something like that? I think so, they throw that diagnosis out. You know, well, I'll tell you the, the bottom line is that, that Abusing parents, whether it's a dad or mom, will falsely accuse the other of unthinkable acts mm -hmm. and instill those thoughts into the children so that they go through their whole life believing that the other parent was terrible. When in and fact, if that isn't what, child abuse, I don't know what is. That is child abuse, trying to turn another, to turn a child to hate another parent. Um, you know, and I always that, thought we should turn those cases around. We find a case is unfounded. We need to turn around and see what that parent is doing psychologically, get this child in counseling, right? Because, you know, this is going to continue. They're going to continue harming well, this child emotionally. And they are, and these children, unfortunately, go into their adulthood, believing a false narrative about either their dad or their mom, when really, the reverse is true. It's most likely the reverse is true that the parent that they hate, that they have no contact with because they've believed a certain narrative is, is most often the one who is loving them unconditionally, would never say a bad thing about the other parent and always had their safety and best interests in, in mind. So it's, it's, it's unfortunate that the, the, Education needs to be out there, especially for ch child family services and, and judges and lawyers, because so often it's the, the abusers that are not held accountable for their actions and that they come away with the custody and all that, plus the, you know, physical, um, having it's that often financially driven. Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah, it comes so, down to. They're using kids, their kids hate for their parent for money. That's what they're doing. Right. right. And it's, it's just an unfortunate, 
scenario. And, and so the good people need to find their voice in whatever way they can. Yeah. Um, and like, I have found my voice in trying to bring awareness to domestic violence, narcissistic abuse, parental alienation by my five book series. And, and, and just trying to add a little bit to the literature that's already out there that, you know, so people could try to understand these dynamics and, and maybe see it and maybe then even see how that played a role in their own life and their own relationship with their, their parents or their children. I mean, they got to arm themselves somehow. Right. And, and knowledge is key and information is key. And I honestly believe, you know, coming full circle that my trauma induced STEs, my spiritual transformative experiences, almost had a bigger purpose, not just to move me from atheist to believer, um, but to show me that there was so much more to this world and to kind of validate for me how I was choosing to handle challenges was the way to do it. And then giving me a voice with my pen because, because of that, I was prompted to follow through and write a five book series within a year's time. I mean, who does that? I was just, it was almost like spirit was behind me to, to bring awareness to yeah. some of these unfortunate family dynamics and, it and all the time, everywhere. Yeah. And people don't yeah. talk about it. So I'm glad you're bringing awareness and yeah. I appreciate yeah. you coming on and it well, doesn't have to be on topic. I mean, we got off topic. So what I just like, that's why I don't have preset questions. I just like spirit to lead us where it wants us to lead. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm glad we had these conversations and, you know, even though I've loved to tune in to, to your podcast and, and the freedom that you give your speakers to just share their experiences, because um, it's so hard to put into words, the spiritual, you know, experiences we have when time stands still. Um, so it's, you have such a wonderful platform for that, but, but maybe this conversation was definitely guided by spirit that it was meant to be, to bring awareness that trauma in many forms can induce spiritual encounters and experiences, which can also lead towards, you know, bringing more honesty and awareness to our world. And, and maybe there's no coincidence I'm sure there's, it's very synchronistic, the timing of it all, because we're all having to face a lot of challenges and just disbelief about what we were meant to believe. Yeah. And when we get that self-awareness of our situation that sometimes we get from connecting to the other side, that is our core strength. And sometimes that's what we're lacking and being able to compete with these controlling narcissist is some kind of inner strength to not match hate for hate but to know how we can go forward right well i'll tell you every single nde or sde that i have heard and i've heard hundreds of them um everyone comes back with the message of love and goodness everyone does and that that is what it's all about. It's not about hate and revenge and setting up other people and manipulating this. And it's not money driven. It's, you know, it's all driven on honesty, love and goodness and compassion. And, and so that's an amazing message. And that's always been my message from day one. So my experiences are just validating and confirming that. And we that's can how learn. I do and we can learn how to handle other people's hate. We don't have to match it with more hate. Cause you see, no. on, you know, like Facebook all the time. And I have learned the hard and long way that I, for example, this morning, this one person kept coming at me. And I'm like, I started to write this thing, you know, get my words back, you know, and I'm like, no, my cat come and laid on me, <laughs> stop me from writing. And I'm thinking, right. I think my cat wants me to stop. So I just deleted that and I approached it in a few sentences that was nice. And we ended up becoming friends and we're going to help each right. other thing, you know? And I'm like, that could have went so differently. Well, it's, it's a human 
reaction to defend yourself, like especially with outright lies. And, and my abuser puts all sorts of lies in legal documents. And your first reaction is to want to defend saying, no, that's not true. Let me prove that it's not true. Here is evidence that is not true. When really that is what they want. They want to set you up. They want us to keep hitting that ball back. Yeah, they want to and, and losing, but they're not prepared yeah. for this other side of, of intelligence that we can possess. Right. It's it's not, you know, it in fact, you know, most people that have had have experienced the domestic violence, they've gone through what is called a smear campaign where the abuser will get their friends, their family, their yes. neighbors, <laughs> their their children. It's so common. And oh, they do it on the news every day too. Right. It's a smear campaign and, and, you know, it's based on outright lies, but yep. sometimes there's like little half truths. But people you know, love to jump on that hate train. It must be right. fun. Like they like, right. feel like they're a part of something and they, they just all clatter to that. They don't care if it's true or not. It's but, just you know, I, to hate I that have, person. Peggy, I have learned though, that if there are people that want to jump on that train, let them jump on that and no. be in that arena. I don't want anything to do with it. Right. I don't have exactly. a need. I never had a need to defend myself because I know my truth. I know my goodness. And actually, deep down, these people know that too. And if they're that stupid and lack of morals that they're doing that to others, I don't want near them. You're right. No. Just let them do it. I'll no, find other because there's other good people. Yeah, actually, when we let go of toxic people in our lives, and it's very painful to let go of a family member or a best friend, or even an abusive spouse, it's very hard to let go of this. We make room in our heart for other like minded people that are filled with our same values of integrity and goodness and love. And I am much happier living a quieter life in the Caribbean with quantity in my relationships okay. as opposed or quality in my relationships as opposed to the quantity. Yeah. I think I of it as a stream seen. cutting off from a river. Let that yeah. river flow and find your little stream, your happy place yeah. and just flow with what works for you. Oh, and that's a great, happiness. that's a great visual. That's a great visual. Yeah, because I'll be happy ruining my little boat and they can all be on the Titanic because it's going to sink. <laughs> right. So I well, really appreciate you know, your time. It's been oh awesome. Oh my gosh, Peggy, this has been a great conversation and uh, it, it certainly went in a direction that I wasn't expecting. But like you said, spirit has a way of, you know, getting out what needs to be out at the time. And well, anybody that has a problem with it, blame it on me because I kept getting you off topic. I'm like, wait a minute, okay. I want to talk no, about no. that more. <laughs> no, that's okay. You know, I just, I, I definitely am passionate about bringing awareness. Um, but at some point, I need to just let go and, you know, focus on this new beautiful life that I have and and stop being pulled into all these negative scenarios. And as, you know, actually, I was going to say, as far as, you know, parents and they get left by their children that just is life you know we wish we was all like the waltons and things but that is really just like they just go off and live their lives and look at the nursing homes they're full of these sad parents their kids never come see them and that is just a fact of life right sadly yeah. is a fact of life that you know our children are so close to us when we're little when they're little and we think it'll always be that way, they're teenagers, they start pulling away and they just pull away, pull away and pull away. And I just think as long as we say, hey, I'm here, I love you. If you ever want to call, if you ever want to come, I'm here. Because I see some people saying, you didn't call me on my birthday. Don't you ever speak to me again? I'm like, what? You can't do that. Just leave the door open. Yeah. So. Well, but, eventually goodness prevails. Eventually yeah, it does. It does. And unfortunately, justice doesn't always. And we hope it's in this lifetime. But I've come to believe that we have many lifetimes or it's a it's a much more vast situation than I thought. So I think things are meant to be in, in its own time. And I just have to hope that, you know, um, awareness will help bring happiness and uh, and 
to other people that are not feeling that necessarily. So all we can do is try, right? That's all we're yeah. doing. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Peggy. You take care. Uh -huh. Bye-bye.